So 35 years later, this is 2003, has a science of intervention evolved? Has this evolved into something that we would recognize as a science of intervention? I think the answer probably is no. We have not achieved perhaps what, what McHarg hoped we might achieve. Has intervention become more scientific? Again, a debatable question, something we might want to debate here. Has the role of technology advanced? Yes. What are the components of that technology? Well, GIS is a very clear and recognizable component. And how should we update the McHarg model? So let me just spend a, a couple of minutes on that. Um, the McHarg team of 2003, this is in contrast then to the McHarg team of 1965, 66, it would contain these days information scientists. We might call them geographic information scientists. They'd be concerned with information integration, information management, semantic interoperability, visualization of scenarios, spatial decision support systems, public participation GIS. All of these things would have been alien terms in the 1960s, but today would be an inevitable part of that McHarg vision. Moreover, we would involve the social sciences, I think, and provide a much richer social context to all of this. So we would involve decision scientists concerned with uncertainty and risk. We'd involve cognitive scientists concerned with the design of human-computer interaction, treating IT as an enabling technology, not imposing itself on the process. We'd involve social psychologists who would be concerned with the process of group consensus. So the science today underlying that McHarg model is much richer than it was in the 1960s. And we would intervene at, I think, a different scale. We would involve environmental economists. We'd involve political scientists in the process. So that's taking that McHarg concept from design with nature in the 1960s and moving it forward. Now let's focus on GIS, because meanwhile, GIS has been developing. GIS, over the past four decades, has become a technology for automated cartography, a technology for measurement, a technology for management of assets, and for scientific discovery. But besides those, McHarg's vision is still one of the roots of GIS. The idea that GIS is a technology for design is there very much in parallel with GIS as a technology for, for example, management of assets. But at the same time, I'd suggest that the McHarg vision has somehow got lost along the way. We've become busy in GIS doing things, other things with GIS, things other than design. So that today I'd suggest that seeing GIS as primarily a design technology is somewhat unusual. And instead, I, when I teach about GIS, I teach about things like managing assets, managing the assets of a utility company, for example. Very different from the design context of McHarg. So perhaps one way of seeing the business we're at here is in redressing that balance bringing GIS back into a more design-oriented technology. So coming back to my two parts, I see GIS, as, I, I see this geodesign context then as having two related parts. The first part is sketch and record, user interaction, sketching ideas, and the second part is evaluate, analyze, predict, model, improve. I struggled to find a nice convenient acronym for the right-hand side. I couldn't find something that was pronounceable. I tried dropping some of the, the letters and substituting others. I'd suggest we make that one of our tasks for this, uh, <laughs> the next three days. Um, I, I thought of referring to this as the yin and yang of geodesign, uh, the left side, the right side, the reds and the blues. Um, somewhere there is an elegant way of expressing this, that there are two interrelated parts that we must consider in our discussions here uh, in the next couple of days. So taking that right-hand side, taking the yang, if you like, what do we know about EAPMI? What do we know about the yang of geodesign? What we know, I think, is that ArcGIS already has many, many tools that do many of these things. But these tools typically are in isolation, and they're not integrated with the sketch and record side of the yin and yang. We have the world of spatial decision support, and I want to credit uh, Night Song uh, Lee and her group, who've done, I think, a tremendous job in building the Redlands Institute SDSS portal, which is a wonderful resource for spatial decision support. But this is still a little short, I think, of what we're here to discuss, which is a much more engaged um, process that involves the community at large 
SDSS still remains, I think, a technology of the expert. So let me just cite a few examples because these are the tools that already exist in ArcGIS for design. And perhaps what they will do is, is illustrate what a broad canvas we are actually here to discuss. Um, the horizon is tremendously broad. So vehicle routing and scheduling, for example. We have numerous tools in Arc Logistics for designing bus routes, delivery routes. We have numerous tools for optimizing travel on networks, minimizing fuel used, minimizing time, etc. So just a couple of quick examples. Here's an ArcGIS application for the um, problems faced by Schindler Elevator. This is designing their daily workload in downtown Los Angeles. Optimization to minimize the amount of time spent traveling between, uh, between sites. The sort of thing, the sort of design task that GIS can already do very well. Here's Sears, another client of ESRI that uh, uses the same kind of technology. So there's one area where design already is there in ArcGIS. Location and allocation, finding the best locations for facilities that serve dispersed populations. Optimizing store sales, minimizing distances traveled, minimizing construction costs. All of them very much designed, but very much focused on infrastructure, very much focused on business. Very different from the kinds of examples we talked about in the first session today. So here, for example, this is actually a competitor. This is GE Small World being used to optimize the location, design the locations of Tesco stores in part of Britain. Um, here is some work I did 30 years ago on school districting in London, Ontario, again using GIS to optimize, to design. And we have abundant technology for locating linear facilities, pipelines, highways, railroads, optimizing environmental impacts, construction costs, operating costs, wildlife corridors. Just a couple of examples. This is something I did recently in the context of uh, Native American pre-Columbian populations in Southern California. Um, this is trafficability. This is the central point is roughly the location of the Santa Ana Airport. And what it illustrates, for example, is how easy it would have been for Native Americans to have passed through the Santa Ana uh, Gorge into the Inland Empire. We can do this kind of thing with existing tools. Here's a wonderful example of using uh, GIS for optimum design. These are the wildlife bridges over the Trans-Canada Highway in Banff National Park. Uh, very successful as ways of allowing wildlife populations to cross the four-lane highway without uh, accident. 